you're the surgeon. Okay. Stephen Temple is uh, widely acknowledged as the best bookseller in Canada. Best or certainly most knowledgeable by many, many people that I've run into, other booksellers. And so you have a great reputation. And, uh, how did you get that reputation? Uh, <laughs> I've been around a long time, you know, and maybe it's more maybe compared to some of the competition. I look good. Uh, it's greatly exaggerated. Uh, you know, I'm not the best bookseller in Canada. I can name you... Uh, I was talking to the one I consider the best uh, yesterday, and in terms of what do we mean by best? Well, he sells more in monetary value. He handles lots of really famous books, everything from illuminated manuscripts to first editions of Jane Austen's to Origin of Species. I mean, all the great books. Who's that? Uh, Cameron Trelevin at Aquila Books in Calgary. My guess is that uh, he's a uh, most financially successful at the moment in Canada, but there are other big players. I'm not one of them. I'm a small player. Yeah, I didn't say... Uh, I'm surprised that you would uh, rate these books out in terms of money. For crying you like out fiction, loud. so you're probably thinking in those veins instead of a more broader no. sorts of books. I guess my uh, definition of best would be someone who has the deepest knowledge in uh, an area that I'm interested in. Which is? Which is modern first editions. Okay, well, Richard Shue at Alphabet knows way more than I do. Just Ooh. test him any time you like. Funny, you so it to be true. You're, you're being uh, self-deprecating here, then. One of the reasons I admire you so much, the descriptions that you put to the books that are posted up on the Internet, you're very generous in terms of providing information that we know takes years to, to track down and accumulate. Many may not put that kind of detailed effort into the descriptions of the books they've got for sale. Can you give me a, a bit of an idea of why you are so generous with this information? <laughs> I, well, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm deliberately not generous with it anymore. If I can, if I can withhold a point, I will. I'll make a point of withholding the, the key piece of information. I love now, because, uh, on the internet, uh, saying first issue, and, and and knowing that most people doesn't don't know that there's more than one issue. And I won't tell you why. How do you? T I, I make sure I don't tell you how to distinguish it directly. And the reason is, is because it's competition. I don't want to win the competition. Mm -hmm. You know, let them uh, discover stuff that I can use. I don't want it to be a one-way street. So, in other words, if there's a particular edition, let's say, of a Kingsley Amos or a Martin Amos, and you know that it's a, a first issue, yeah. you say it's a first issue, but what, there may have been other... Uh, it may have to be in green cloth or yeah. what, like... Right. You know, so if it, and by the way, if the knowledge is already out, if it's well known anyway, I don't bother playing the game, you know, I'll just say, uh, you know, first issue in green cloth. I'm talking about my little discoveries, my little uh, world of can let, uh, you know, where I have sort of done some record keeping when there is anything like that, so... That I try and keep to myself. Okay. Can you give us one little secret? Give, reveal the secret. W reveal one, just one little well, secret. Well, here, look at this. W.O. Mitchell, who has seen the wind? Right, Beautiful a, copy. That's the best copy I've seen in 15 years. Uh, unfortunately, the, the guy, rubber stamp, is not. Uh, yeah. This is direct. It's the best copy I've seen in 15 years. Uh, it, it's price clipped, I see, but still, uh, it's gorgeous I, shape. I look for a fine copy for, for that long. Yeah, I can't find it. You have to settle for this. Is a, this is really good for this book? Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to settle for this. You're not getting a perfect example of dust jacket. You keep waiting forever. I have been. Anyway, you asked me what's the secret. Well. That's one secret. That's the first binding. Red goes to blue next. The second binding is blue. So the dust jacket is the same dust jacket? The binding has gone from red to blue, correct? Oh, uh, there are two issues of the jacket as well. Okay. 
But wait a sec. So, so, so there are two a issues of the jacket on the red binding, or mm -hmm. okay. So the first, real first one, is the red binding with the first issue jacket. Okay. The second one is the red binding with the second issue jacket. Mm -hmm. Then the next one is the blue with the second issue jacket. And I've only seen blue with second issue jacket. Never seen one in first issue. So, but the, the red, the red ones have both jackets. This is the second issue jacket. It's got quotes from reviews on the rear flap. That's one of the giveaways of the second issue jacket. Also, there are ten lines here of biographical info. A, there are eight on the on the first issue jacket. <laughs> That's good. Now, so, how did you find that out? You call us the publisher? No, no, never. But then, how do you, you notice it? How do you know the the the, the ten liners? Let's look at some of the other. This I find really fascinating these days. I, if I had any time and information, I'd write a paper on it. We got lots of time. You know, you got so much business this. rolling in, and you, you, you don't what have to What are we looking for? at here? See that? I left it deliberately. You left a uh, dollar forty-nine. What was it? Said three dollars. Yeah. Slash a dollar forty-nine. You you paid for you paid a dollar forty-nine. No, that was a second? new bookstore activity. That was a remainder price. Right. So what's happened with the remainder? Probably the copies have been around a while. Thus. We got a second issue jacket on this book that was sold at half price. New, I think. I don't think that's a used book price. Um, right, so that's one tip off that it's a second issue jacket. The clip of the jacket was probably done by the uh, the, the publisher. To take the original price. I, I don't remember. I might have a record of what would be printed there, but. When they wanted to say three dollars slash dollar forty nine, it might have said two fifty here, but it had gone up in retail price and in the interim years. That's oh, a guess. Okay. Yeah. But I, there are lots of little clues like that in books. Booksellers' yeah. codes, pencil codes. I sometimes, if, you know, try and crack uh, when I'm looking for clues. Yeah. But to, to those things, you know, you look at review copies. You know, they turn up, and then you say, aha. Yeah. And thus, that's, that's the why of uh, the general practice of charging a little more for a review copy. There soon to be amongst the first copies on the market. Although these days, review copies are usually paperback, whereas the first edition or advanced reading copies, right? Or did they back, uh, pa you know, previous to whatever this come? Did, did they actually send copies of the the very first hardback edition out as review copies? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Okay, sure. So if there's, uh, and you know, they still do. So if there's any doubt, you know, hey, this book is I've seen it in green, I've seen it in red. Is there any binding preference or priority? Uh, if you look at the review copies and they're all a certain color, you draw the conclusion that that's the first uh, issue binding. You watch, uh, you record ownership uh, inscriptions, you know, to Aunt B from Joe for Christmas 1948. Well, he bought it new to give us a Christmas present. Eh? So you know the object in, in, in the hand was sold new. And the, yeah, that sort of information. Uh, well, unless, uh, unless the purchaser was a cheapskate and picked it up second hand. Unlikely. You know, most Christmas presents then as now are bought new. Yeah. I'm talking to Stephen Temple, bookseller extraordinaire. So you divulge information about books on the website that, that you think will help sell the book, and the points that you include would be the ones that you think are fairly generally available, and you don't divulge the stuff that you've spent a lot of time finding out. So you want to put as much on the description as you can to sell a book without uh, giving your competition all sorts of valuable... If I were to put that book on the internet, which I don't have to, I just choose which of a couple of people that are waiting for it to favor with the offer. Yeah. But if I would, I would say, you know, I'd describe it in red cloth. I'd say it's in red cloth, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't twig let anyone know that that was in itself significant. I would just say 
first the first binding, uh, first issue binding, and the second issue jacket. So you wouldn't tell them what color it was. No. Yeah. I, well, I would. I would say that you know, if I'm describing a book online, I would say it's in red cloth. Right. But I wouldn't necessarily say. And by the way, that's the issue point of the first binding. Got it. Okay. I would just pass by that fact and then go on and say the first issue binding. But uh, you probably find others already online that over the years have picked it up. I mean, I, it's my process is not unique. Anyone could have done it if they wanted to notice and make notes. And yeah. So. What you're describing is detective work. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's like identifying a, a first edition, uh, in my experience, is, is a process of elimination. Well, I mean, I don't do what a proper bibliographer does, which is go look at their publisher's records or whatever, you know, author's, printer's records, publisher's records that exist. That's how you properly do this. I go at it the other way, just on, it's really based on probabilities. It's not really proper, uh, but I really don't have the time to go fly to Seattle and look at somebody's papers and... So, if you're a, a serious collector of a, a specific author, your first step should be to pick up the bibliography that has been put together for that author. If you're really serious, you would then go to the publisher's archives and do some research there. Is that something that Joe, a uh, book collector, could do? Not usually. Uh, the publishers, first of all, are in the business of making a book and publishing a book. and. Identifying first editions is pretty low on their priority. Uh, they, you know, a straight, simple question. They may not know the answer, you know, and they don't want every everybody going through the archives if they even have them. Again, they're in business to try and uh, sell books and make a profit, not be a resource center for scholars. Once papers are given to a university, as in the case of uh, McCall and Stewart and Macmillan, they, those papers, publishers' papers and university archives, so that's, so scholars can research them there, but a working publisher, yeah, he might be talked and they'll let you look at his papers, but he might not. There's confidential stuff in their papers, and it's a bother, you know, it doesn't, get, it doesn't earn them any money, why should they, you know, they're busy. Just only yesterday, I was up at the University of Toronto talking to Richard Landon, the Rare Books Librarian with the uh, Fisher Library. It's their Rare Books Library at the U of T. It's one of the great collections in North America. Uh, Is it open to the public? Or? Oh, <laughs> Richard Landon, who's the director, always makes a point of saying this is a public institution. He does not want people to think, that, oh, they mustn't come here and touch the rare books or ask to look at the rare books because. And they do, in fact, belong to the people. They paid for them, um, and it's a public institution. It's, it's not part of the university? Then. Sure, it's part of the university, but so is the University of Toronto. It's a public institution. It's paid with taxpayers' money. And, uh, Partially, yeah. It's not a private university, and it's not a private library. It's uh, mm. paid for by the Ontario taxpayer. So, uh, at any rate, I mean, you go into a place, it does feel <laughs> nonetheless pretty intimidating for Joe Average off the street to go in and ask anything. Uh, I, I, even I feel intimidated. <laughs> and I know the librarian. <laughs> but, uh, well, what is it that intimidates you? Well, have you, have you ever seen it? No. It's a, it's like a cathedral. Is it like, I've been to the, the Getty Library oh, in New York. Well, is that the same idea? Well, I don't know. It's bigger. Yeah. Like you, people don't understand that U of T library. One year, there only Harvard was more aggressive when they're buying North American libraries. They they're one of the great North American research libraries. No idea of that. Well, they're world, you know, they are truly world class. I hate to use yeah. that, but they are they're very sophisticated and very deep in certain collections. So maybe you could describe what do you mean? They actually had a budget to go out and purchase uh, first yeah. editions of, of they works? Knock on wood, cross your fingers. Look, maybe we shouldn't say this too loud, but they've been allowed a budget to acquire all these years, you know. From every author around the world, or mostly Canadian? or They have the world's greatest Can Lit collection, but that's just beside. They have a lot of the world's greatest 
they have the world's greatest Bertrand Russell collection in printed form. Uh, they have one of the world's great Galileo collections. They have uh, they have great Shakespeare collection. Lots of things. What doesn't the U of T collect is more and more the question. Would it then simply depend upon whoever happened to be the chief librarian and their tastes and their interests? That they had this budget that then they could go after whatever they thought was uh, was what a good deal or of interest to the Canadian public or what? Well, U of T is blessed with one of the great librarians who just his knowledge is, is just phenomenal. This is rich. Yeah, Richard Landon. So. Yeah, his, his taste and judgment has a lot to do with it. All these research libraries, they're kind of trying to fit together. If they're strong in something, some field, they, they will be more inclined to add in those areas. Or if it's sort of an off subject for them, they're pretty lukewarm about buying things. Trying to build on their strength, they are also influenced by their staff and scholars currently at the university. If they're doing a lot of research in some area, then they might they might collect in that area. You know, if, if little of the faculty ever seems to care about, I don't know, Algerian literature, then they don't really collect a lot of it. Uh, mm -hmm. you know? So it's just driven by the scholars that are there. But of course, I mean, over the years, lots of specialist scholars give the, the library their massive collections, so instantly they have strong holdings in any given subject. You know. We had a, a brief chat uh, earlier about the nascent uh, book collector, how they might approach uh, collecting, and uh, you had some interesting advice on uh, what they might start off with without breaking the bank. Well, I, uh, I always like to see collectors use some imagination. Nothing uh, bores me more than have a new person say, well, I think I'd like to collect Faulkner or Hemingway or Fitzgerald. I mean, it's the same old, same old. Uh, suppressing so yawn and ask about their bank account, you know, I'm much more interested by kind of out of the way collectors who either do a subject or an unusual author. Uh, uh, those, those I, I like working more with those guys. I mean, they, with you, if you collect famous, obvious books, it's a question of having the capital to buy them. And if, as a dealer, it's a you know, question of me having the, the capital to buy an expensive Hemingway. I, Knowing that, you know, my collector may decide he doesn't want it for some reason. I could find myself having invested a lot of money, and uh, he's not obliged to buy it. Uh, you know, you have to have a certain amount of money and uh, balls, I guess, t to play in those upper regions. And I never had a lot, a lot of money. Uh, so a lot of what I do and what I like to do really is sort of scuttle around some of the minor writers and byways of literature. Uh, uh, Canadian literature is still such, there's so many, there's so many 19th and early 20th century novel, or novels and writers that i never seen an example of the work, didn't even know they were Canadian, don't know a thing about them, and here they published a dozen novels. I just found one the other day and said, ooh, this guy's, guy's got a long list of mystery novels and stuff, and the golden age of mystery novels. And God, I, I, I really love this stuff. Well, you know, too, it's like the, uh, the, the Canadian literature is dirt cheap. No, always. No, not all, but the high points are not necessarily dirt cheap. But, for example, a friend of mine uh, is an avid collector, and he's probably got one of the best collections of Callahan, Morley Callahan, in, in the world. I think what comes into play here is you have to read a bunch of books to develop your own taste, and then an author that may not be that well known, but you know that their stuff is really good, and then it's exciting to go after someone like that because not very many people know about them, but you think that they're great. He was telling me in an earlier interview that he feels that uh, Callahan is the uh, is the equal of Hemingway, and yet an early Callahan, uh, strange, uh, whatever that goes for, beside one of the first Hemingway novels, it's a joke. It's like 30, 50 times more expensive to get the Hemingway. Yeah, right, indeed. And no one much collects uh, Callahan. Uh, I got offered one of the great Callahan collections that I know I've ever seen uh, some years ago, and I I didn't I 
I said, I didn't even think about buying it. I said, no, there's no way I can buy it. Uh, I can try and sell it for you on consignment, but I've got to prepare you for the, you know, the reality that we're probably not going to sell a high percentage of it. And uh, I didn't get involved in the end, but... Well, yeah, that sort of speaks to my my point, though. You know, if someone had come to you with a with a good deal on a Hemingway uh, collection, you'd probably take a careful look at that. Especially if you you, oh, you know if you've got a good deal on it, you know you'd move it like crazy. Well, it, it, a good Hemingway collection would be over my head, but I would partner with somebody uh, in the trade, with this my friend in Calgary or some other American colleague. That's what you do. If you don't have the cash and you've got the opportunity, good Lord, don't let it walk, you know. Get a hold of a colleague, you know, who's got the capital and uh, deals in the material. And uh, that's what you do. It's not a bad idea that if you're if you're getting into the collecting game to start collecting uh, an author that you may have liked and read when you were young, like a teenager, uh, and then develop a complete collection of that particular... I think you should always fundamentally collect with your heart. And then engage your mind in the process. Let's hope they're not in too much conflict. I mean, uh, you said collecting enthusiasms of your teens. Well, ob obviously your tastes change in what you liked in your teens. You, you may have adored writers now you consider to be pretty, you know, be your c string writer, you know, but at the time you liked them a lot. It's okay to collect those guys, you know, you know it's fun, you, you know the score, but it's more deeply fulfilling, I think, to, to find an author that stays with you most of your life or much of your life deep enough to keep engaging you. Mm -hmm. And... Um, well, the thing is, though, often these, you know, acknowledged authors are the best authors. So, for example, with J.M. Quetzia, who I think is my favorite author, or close to it. Now, I, uh, I've got most of his work, and I just forked out about 1500 bucks for his first Dusk Plans signed. But that's the problem. It was a fair amount of money, and a lot of people know about him. So you're torn between... My approach is I want to get a, a great collection of the, the most highly acclaimed novels of, say, the last 50 years or that were written during my lifetime, yeah, let's say. Okay. And that, that beca that, that's expensive, but it's also it's, it's a nice challenge to, to find reasonably priced versions of the most highly acclaimed, like all the bookers, for example. Yeah. And, that, and that costs money. You got that up against developing a niche, as you've said, that no one else is going to travel. Well, I mean, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Cootsie as, as an example, but how many other of his books did you have to pay a whole lot of money for? That's true. You know, okay, there's one that, that you know, hurts, but after that, you, you, you've got a lot of room to track down all kinds of proofs and firsts and variants. I mean, you know, it would mostly wouldn't be very expensive, you know. So yeah, you're right. I just want a collector to collect things that mean something to him. That's the soundest basis. And I, I, as I mentioned earlier, how turned off I am by budding collectors who mention the same things. As, I mean, where did you get that idea? Is yeah. Faulkner really your favorite writer? Yeah. <laughs> that's you tough. Know, you just think that that's who you ought to collect. That's what or you ought to collect, or are you going to make money at it? Because they think they ought to collect. Yeah. It. I don't like. I don't. I don't buy the collect who you like. Are, are, uh, we're both talking about authors. We're both sort of oriented that way. But let's talk about subjects. You know, I've often wondered what if more people collect the history of their profession. Yeah. You know, we can. There's lots of professions that are. <laughs> no one else is tracking them down. It's wide open. You know. I was doing a bit of that in the media relations communications field, and I was able to pick up uh, author uh, Raymond Williams's first two books for I think they I paid about fifty bucks each for them in in fine condition, uh, published in the fifties, and he's a, as important as McLuhan is, but it didn't break the bank. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody collects fox hunting or riding to hounds anymore but let me tell you, there's a lot of sumptuous books out there waiting for customers because there were a lot of books in the fox hunting era that are really physically very handsome deluxe productions and is, I don't find any customers for I think that's finished you know uh, well literally I guess in the last I mean, couple of years unlike something like falconry which you would think who does that well not very many people since 
way back, but it's you know it's a good they're supposedly a good sort of category of books for an anagram bookseller to do well, but mm -hmm. I mean, who the hell does Falcon again? But there weren't so many books on there, lots of books on writing to hounds that uh, once was very popular. So there's an opportunity for a collector to come relieve the bookseller's soul. soul. <laughs> Big old heavy books on fox hunting, fox hunting because I don't think it's going to make a comeback, frankly. <laughs> I'm a big fan of William Morris and the huge impact that he had and the Kelmscott Press and uh, the way his wonderful designs sort of made their way into daily living but yeah try and get a, something that's published for, from the Kelmscott Press a uh, hundred or more years ago you're looking at taking out a mortgage on your your house or second mortgage you can buy lots of Morris for uh, not tons of money there's some up there somewhere. Uh, some of the Morris is pretty expensive, I admit, but not all of it. I'd love to get a really good example of a Kelmscott Press book. Well, some are more expensive than others, is what I'm saying. You know, they're not all so. I mean, they're all going just for what? Sorry, money. because of their uh, because of their rarity. They're, they're not rare. They're expensive. Some are rare, but mostly they, they're expensive. This uh, one's gorgeous because it looks like it's sort of got almost like embroidery on the cover. Well, this is his cloth design mm. uh, of that paper. Now, would this have come with a jacket or not? Oh, no, that wouldn't have. Come That's prior to that, eh? Yeah. yeah. So I've had some work, restoration work done on that. On one. this one? Yeah, yeah. on the spine. Uh, right. And what price have you got on this one? I haven't priced it yet. I'm sort of sitting there. Waiting for that. Waiting for How that. Did, where'd you get this one from? Well, I bought it. I think I bought it from a professor. Uh, and I paid real money for it. Is that an ex library? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, I've been nervous about that provenance. Where the, he said I that he bought, they had a sale, and he bought them. That just makes me nervous. Were these really deaccessioned or what? What, what do you I mean? Shouldn't. What are you talking about? Well, was, are they stolen books or are they discards? And it can be pretty hard to answer that because libraries deaccession take a lot out of their collections. Lots of stuff have little sales and big sales, and they don't always mark them. Some are, you know, rubber stamp discarded, but they don't always get around to that. And they don't always have records of what they did. What one librarian might have come in and said, We need a new broom around here, and out the door goes a lot of those musty old print books. We need a few more computers. And there's not necessarily a detailed record of what was the accession when, so get a book with library stamps on it and you wonder did somebody just not return it I mean, so you think get rid of it and it can be hard to tell so in, the, in this particular instance you're suggest you're, you're when you say you're concerned about it right I don't want to, I don't want to if it really was never discarded by a library, I don't want it in my stock it's got to go back no matter what but, but well, yeah well, so that's what I'm getting be at delicate um, what I'm getting at though is okay you bought it off this guy this professor your concern is that it, that not necessarily him, but someone he bought it off may have ripped it off out of a library, and then that the library can come somehow trace it back and and reclaim it, or like why are you nervous? Would look pretty bad. Uh, I'd be immoral to uh, knowingly handle library property. Mm -hmm. Uh, but on the other hand, it can be very hard to find out if it is or it isn't. If I contact that library. Um, which ultimately is what one has to do. Uh, they may or may not know if, uh, and one always worries that, well, will they be truthful with me? Will they think, God, we once had a copy, and I wish to hell we still had one of those. Yeah, 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 that's our book, send it back. Well, yeah, one of their, some years ago, one of their librarians legitimately uh, took it out and it was sold on behalf of the library and all that. It's not their property. And you sort of wonder sometimes if they're going to be level with you. Well, especially... I'll tell you, some years ago, one of my scouts brought in 
a modern poetry book. Don't ask me what, but it was a famous poet earlier in the century. Yeah. It was a severely limited edition. Somebody in Wallace Stevens or somebody like that. It was like it was one, unknown, right? one of 12 or some crap like that. It was wow. like really severely limited. Wow. And it had the, the marks of the Detroit Public Library in it. And I told my scholar, I said, look, I don't know if I can't really believe they would have pitched this out. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have to contact them. If it turns out that it's their book, then the right thing for you to do is let me send it to them. You know, we're not going to do any buying and selling here. If, that, if, it, if it isn't their book, then it's still worth a lot of money, as ugly as the copy is, because of a severe limitation. Anyway, I emailed the library there and. I said, look, your record on my record shows you having a copy of this. Do you still have, have one of those? I mean, the library and respect. No, we don't. Uh, so I sent no. it to them. No, we don't. It's been stolen. Or that, no, that's that's so, right. There's so many books in libraries that, that do go missing, right? Yeah, I know. So it's hard to say for sure. Was it stolen? Was it Michelle? Uh, uh, I had to take her word for it that you know, according to them, they should still have this book. But I, I mean, I looked online. I, I would have been a little more cautious, but I look online, I see the record. It appears that it records the, the book I have in my hand. So it, it tells me in their minds they still have that book in their collection. So at that point, I say, Go look, do you still have this book in your collection? And they said, No, we don't. Well, here it is. Off it goes. And, uh, well, time goes by, and suddenly I get a messenger's bouquet of flowers. Is that right? From the librarian. The only time in my life anybody ever sent me flowers, you know. Because it was really, it was sort of a, a high point. It's a nice thing to have, yeah. say, you have in your collection. It was somebody like Wallace Stevens or wow. a real major guy, and it's, you know, they're one of 12 or something, something you know. Great story. If you, saw, if you discarded it, you were a damn fool, you know. Yeah. And you also in that era, like that era where they mutilate the book to, with the perforations and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Not only did you discard it, but you mutilate it, so you're going to tie you to the stake and burn you with old copies of the Reader's Digest and Biblio, Biblio Hell for your sins, you know. <laughs> You mentioned book scouts. Now, scouts, to enlighten our audience, so these are people that go around like us collectors do, and they go to book sales and thrift stores, and uh, typically, if they're collectors, they'll come in with a selection of books. They know what you're after, and you either give them a trade value so they can buy something here with it, or you give them cash, right? Is that how you get most of your books these days? I get a significant portion of my books from book scouts. Yep. Although there's not as many... There's as many as I want to tell you the truth. It can get to be too many, and you don't want to look at you don't want to look at every damn book somebody bought somewhere for nothing that day. You know, you really want guys on your wavelengths. Yeah. The things that really yank my chain. Not just every damn used book in the world. You want to see it. Yeah. But a lot of them are in business for themselves. They ain't going to bring me anything. Yeah. They, they just go listen to themselves on eBay or somewhere else. Yeah. Unlike the old days. Others have realized really they yeah, make more money in the end uh, just wholesaling it off because you at least move everything and you turn your money real quick. I mean, my chief scout has certainly made a lot more money in the book business than I ever have, you know, but he works seven days a week. He has no life except buying books cheap based sort of an automaton. And, uh, if, he, if he were more knowledgeable, he'd be dangerous, but he doesn't know quite as much as he should after being around for a long time, but what he makes up for it in sheer determination and volume, because amongst all those books, by gosh, there are some plums that, that turn up, you know. Dangerous in the sense that he could, what, set up his own store and take business away from you? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. He doesn't do anything on the net. No, he does My main guy, he's, he's content to buy for a dollar and sell for three or five, uh, He's made more, way more money with that philosophy than 
buying for a dollar and selling for a hundred eventually someday maybe uh, have a lot of money tied up he just turns it and turns it and turns it and turns it and what kind of money could a person like that make in a year well he could make fifty thousand a year is that right eh through you well, I'm not his only customer no true he could make more I don't know now, what do you pay? Uh, you typically would uh, look at the. Uh, you, you sort of look at it and say, "Okay, I can make. Uh, I can make hundred bucks off this book. It may take me six months or a year to sell it, but uh, okay. So there's a hundred bucks. I'm going to give him ten percent." Well, if you don't like the book, you might. You, there are occasions when you will give only ten percent. Would be when you don't like the book, when it's got condition problems, when it bores you, when. You think you know? I might, in the end, finally have to heavily discount this thing to sell it. You know, so hundred is almost a myth. Uh, sure, you might only pay ten bucks, but it depends on how much you like the book, how long you you think you're going to have to keep it, as to how much you pay. Uh, it's a hundred dollar level. Uh, he's he's doing just fine if you give him fifty percent. You know, he shouldn't expect you to give him more than that. More than fifteen bucks. Fifty five zero. Oh, you give and, it, you give him half. Well, if it's something, yeah, I've got a customer for like that who has seen the wind. I got to pay him. I'm going to pay him something less, about half, because I know I can turn that. Well, what are you going to pay him then? Well, I don't know. Unfortunately, he's got a problem copy with his rubber stamps. I can't, in good conscience, sell this to my person I have in mind because he depends on me to make the right choices and this is not the right copy. I've got to go buy a bright jacketless copy with no names which means spending money because guys are now... And then you'd marry it with I wouldn't marry it. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with marrying. Look, some people think there is. I do, I'm not one of them. I would say it's married. You know, once the buyer has lost that knowledge, then no one may know again. Uh, although I find few examples of older books with dust wrappers, but even when you can't sort of, you really look close to the well, it's often little soil spots that match, you know. If you're sort of used to it, you can often say, well, this jacket wasn't always on this copy, you know. But the interesting thing, too, is uh, a lot of these uh, sellers and scouts, they'll go to uh, library sales. The jackets themselves from the libraries are protected, and you can try and take it off, right? Not always. So the label on the spine, and those things are devilishly hard to remove. Huh. I'm moving less and less into things as a jacket critical to more non-fiction material. Uh, what do you mean by that? I thought, like, non-fiction, uh, it, it needs to be written and it's got a dust jacket. It, it has to be in for fine condition. To, to I mean, outside of modern literature, you know, if the book doesn't have a dust jacket, it's not worthless. Well, well give me an example, then, of, uh, you say you're getting away from stuff that's dust jacket critical, like, so you would go in, what, science or whatever? Well, I sold a collection of, like, 25 scientific papers from the turn of the 19th century, 1796 to about 1805, bound up in a quarto format. Most were either pre-prints or off-prints of articles that would have appeared in the transactions of the Royal Society. Some of them clearly came out before the magazine version was, was published, and they were financed and for the author's use in tiny runs. And then off prints would be. Uh, this was before the the for the magazine. Yeah, some of them clearly because they would bear statements from the society secretary saying, "Please don't quote any uh, th a thing you read here until such and such a date when this has actually been published." So, but the author would would finance that, and they would they would print fifty, few dozen for him to send around to his friends and so on. Like, anyway, it was a bound up volume of mostly one guy's work, but a few other people and he had written and he had inscribed inside the cover what he had bound up and how these paper, other guys' papers had some bearing on his stuff, so he enclosed them and, you know, he, this is a one-off kind of thing and uh, mostly kind of seeming, seemingly boring. Well, it turns out he discovered one element of the periodic table uh, so there was the paper there that covered the discovery of an, not an element you, you don't know, pay any attention to, uh, but something. And there was a very early science paper on Australia. In fact, the National Library of Australia wanted to buy this. 
because it because there's only a couple of known copies of that off print according to the bibliography, and I had one of them. How'd you get that through a scout? No, I bought it from a dealer. Another book dealer. Yeah. And they didn't know what they had. Basically, too lazy to do the work. Mm -hmm. Buy cheap, sell four or five times what you pay, and move on. You started off by saying you know, respect, blah, blah, blah. I like to be wordy because I like to do this research stuff, you know, and a lot of dealers could, I just could care less about it. That's something the underlings do, and then they will be told that's the right. And they themselves don't care or don't have the flair. Uh, they just want to make money at it. I can spot those variants, you know. They, they call to me as I notice these things. And, uh, the variants mean the points. Yeah, variants, let's say. We don't necessarily know what they mean. We just know the basic thing. Well, that looks different from that. Why? The why, you don't necessarily have time to track down, but you notice the difference. And, and that is the, for you, that's the real joy of what you do. Uh, that's one of the, Passions. hey, I've never seen that in blue cloth before. What the hell is that? You know, look at that Songs of a Superdough. It's in brown cloth. We think they did 50 or or so in brown cloth. So you, you, you see one of these suckers, and then then you use your own detective work rather than sort of going to uh, some uh, academic, you know, collection at, at some academic institution. You basically, you are the detective. You, that, well, that's what turns your crank. Sort of in a half-assed way. I mean, not really proper. The real detective did go to the institution in the case of Robert Service. Uh, there was a guy who went around the institutions and he published the bibliography, yeah. and I rely on on it. Although I don't always agree with him, I, he wasn't advanced. And so, are you a wannabe bibliographer? I am a bibliographer, but not a proper one. I'm. A, it's a collaborative process. I'm the guy, old Colonel So and So, that published them. A bibliography of Charles Dickens way back in 1932, and it's got most of the books more or less right, sort of, but they left out, you know, it's a beginning, it's first steps and, and build on it, you know, you look at early, early bibliographies and they're not, you know, there's an older D.H. Lawrence that's okay, but it's nothing like Roberts, you know, like, and, um, you know, when you have the real good ones. I missed that. What do you What do you mean by Roberts? What's that? A different name. Lawrence you mean? Bibliog, the standard Bibli. You always, if you collect D. H. Lawrence, you know that Roberts A. Sixty two, and it's always Roberts. Yeah, you know, Roberts is the guy that did the Bibliog. Yeah, but there was an earlier one. There there an name? earlier bibliographer, or uh, yeah, of Lawrence. You know, just that I think Lawrence may have still been alive at the time. You know, but there's I have a copy. I don't know why I keep it around. You know, presumably Roberts. Used that to build up. He looked at every dot and comma in there and either said, yeah, that's right, or no, here's what it was, and, you know. So I'm sort of a half-assed uh, uh, bibliographer. Yeah, yeah, but, I mean, it's, you know, it makes me money, too. Look, I just sold an obscure Canadian novel for 3500 Canadian dollars. What's that one called? Well, I'd rather not say which one. I won't say which one. From the 30s. Okay. It's the only copy of the of the English edition I've ever seen, let alone a nice one in a jacket. Or English? Maybe, you mean there's a French one? No, a, no, no there's the uh, American edition. Okay, this is a British first rather than a Canadian first. There was no Canadian first. Okay, but he was a Canadian author. He was a Canadian. Yeah, sure, but there was yeah. a lot of books that never got published, published at the here, time. Yeah. yeah, like Ritzler's first book. There was no Canadian. Edition. It's American, right? British. Or was it? Well, he lived in. Well, he lived yeah, in, British and American. Yeah, because he was no Canadian until you don't get Canadian until duty. Yeah, in fact, it's interesting. The uh, horses, uh, Saint Saint Urbain's uh, horseman was published by McClellan and Stewart from the American, uh, what you call it, pages? Plates. The plates. Are the sheets. Uh, sheets, yeah. Printed in the U.S., uh, all the sheets printed in there. Um, yeah, you get a lot of that. Where was I? You just oh, sold this, this, this for 3500 yeah, like yeah. never heard of this book. Really. Yeah, yeah. All of this. Uh, been a paperback reissue, I think, in the 80s or something. Uh, 
uh, and the Americans, uh, there was a bird at an A.L. Bird, you know, that old yeah. print house. Yeah. They did one, and uh, there was like three printings of the American Trade Edition hardcover. That's that's reasonably good in the marketplace for a first yeah. novel by nobody. But the real first is British, published by Minor House that only lasted a few years. Uh, 30s book, Nice and Jacket. You know, it's bloody rare. Yeah. And of its kind, it's the most important Canadian book novel of its kind, and on the top ten list of world novels of its kind, but little known. Um, so top ten list of world novels. Uh, yes, I yes, I know to somebody mean, that's made a. You mean acknowledged as one of the best? A, a readily acknowledged, no, uh, but knowledgeably acknowledged. I mean, you know, I talked to a colleague that's made a specialty of of that subject and uh, in his opinion it was clearly one of the top ten worldwide of its kind but obscure um, so your knowledge that's your, what I like to yeah do. you're investing in all sorts of interesting sort of ephemera uh, or, or I'm rediscovering our lost literature that's what I like to do I like so to is that your legacy then that's right Stephen uh, Temple you would like to be known once you die on your gravestone you'd like lost recoverer of lost treasures yeah sure we're a rescue operation and we are too rescuer of um, of of work that should be uh, read and acknowledged and enjoyed that well, isn't now yeah but we're feeble we have feeble critical influence that's the job of the critics and puffers to sort of get you know build up by rereading them but my, I have the physical object to deal with I'll, I'll show you a graphic example of what I mean by a person you know rescue mission I'll show you an object that was an hour away from being in landfill and lost forever oh wow it was often an object that came to me off the streets of Toronto oh wow <laughs> Through a, here. through a scout. The tourist of the scout. It's Dickensian's story. Uh -huh. Tourist meaning. The guy had, like, that's what, he has so little money that that's where he gets his stuff. He's a, he's a garbage picker. Yeah, garbage picker. Uh, but, you know, if he could have made 10 bucks that day, he'd have been doing good. Yeah. Um, he made a thousand. But, I mean, it was unbelievably. Uh, bad condition because uh, it was curbside and it had been in the basement. Right. And it had heavy mildew stains. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you, uh, that hasn't been improved upon? Yes, it you? has. Oh, it has, yeah. Look at the spine. That's all we could lay down of the spine and have it still look. Uh, no, we, have, we, have, we have cloth loss there and there. We have this damp, this mildewing. So the margin. Fortunately, no text is actually lost, but it's ugly. Yeah. Now, and it was in a box. No, I had that. Oh, you had that made. Okay. okay oh, so it's signed. So poems wow. by Oscar Wilde, number nine of this yeah. first edition of 220 copies, signed by Oscar Wilde. Oh man. But like that guy that sells steak oh. knives on TV, but it gets better. It gets better. <laughs> Also, Holland Lloyd, from his friend, the author, London, that's uh, his wife's sister. This is the only guy that came to visit him in Reading Jail, and the guy who came to say, well, your wife wants a divorce, and was never really all that much against him, but... Uh, oh, and that so was on the streets that was of Toronto. Toronto. streets of Toronto, found wow. by the first of the scouts, who really doesn't know very much, but I mean, it's Oscar. Well, he knows Oscar Wilde, though, eh? He knows enough to know Oscar Wilde's, but I mean, it's a oh. nice-looking object, eh? Nice wow. 90s design. That was like an hour from going out being picked up for garbage, and I didn't get there the, the hour before in lots of cases. I mean, you look back through history, a lot of things have been thrown away. Yeah, yeah. So I think actually, when I think of how many people there are in the city, and how much, how many books there really are in the city this size, I think, what if, what if everybody brought their used books to me? Well, I would think so many 
Pearson Airport to receive them and to take their books. I mean, what happens to all those books? That the majority are simply thrown away. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But that would include a lot of mass market paperbacks, but it also include Uncle Harry's stupid old used books. Throw them away. Uncle ha Harry collected quantum theory, or who knows what Uncle Harry did, you know, but uh, a lot of stuff's been lost. Yeah. The, uh, maybe just in concluding, I, I, I started talking about uh, William Morris and uh, the Kelmscott Press and, and the fine, the fine, uh, it's a work of art. These are beautiful works of art, his, his, uh, the books that he, he published. And, uh, but, but as I say, I, I think some of the better known ones are, are out of the reach of most, uh, most people uh, and collectors financially. But, um, uh, so then I started looking well, at Canadian fine presses. And um, there's one I came across called The Golden Dog. Uh, that um, apparently they revived it fairly recently with you know, they do paperbacks and stuff like that. But um, maybe you could tell me in in that area where what 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 to collect in the fine press category in Canada that not that many people are aware of, but they made beautiful books. I don't know. It's a it's a it's a kind of collecting I don't personally much care for. And the reason is it's artificial in a way. Uh, a lot of effort is. I mean, the product is beautiful, but it's all a closed process, and the survival rate of those objects is high because they always cost money, and people who acquired them took care of them, and and uh, over the years, if they're still wanted, it's pretty often just a matter like Kelmscomp. Scott Press of having cash to buy one. They're always on the market. Mm. So they're not rare. I, I like things that accidentally became sought after or uh, yeah, accidentally like Anna Green Gables. Who could have ever guessed? Uh, another girl's book, eh? You know, she wasn't the best writer of her day. You know, there were lots of other girls book writers that weren't noticeably inferior. How could you have ever guessed? You know, it was an accident, you know. Uh, well, maybe she has the. That's the thing. Uh, we touched on it earlier too. It's it's interesting. It seems like artists. If you've got a good agent, if you, you know, if you've got someone that really sort of hustles your stuff, and and yeah. a critic who just goes nuts over your stuff, yeah. that that's often how. If you've got a champion, and and that's sort of uh, that that's sort of a fun area that I'm, I'm looking into as well with a friend. But you know, even so, you got they got to be effective, and sometimes they got to work the, the midway rather than take the high road. Look, look at look at Edmund Wilson, mm. famously quoted as more like Callahan is the most unjustly neglected English language novelist. Do you think that fired up a lot of collectors? No. Mm. A guy like Edmund Wilson, a giant, yeah. says you should... You know, and but a lot of people don't agree with Edmund Wilson. I'm one of them. Mm. Uh, I don't really see much in him myself. But uh, I'm with. Who, who I'm do with you see? Who do you see m most in in a, in a, in a uh, Canadian writer that's reasonably priced? I still champion David Adams Richards, although I can't pretend that his first few books are, are cheap. They're not. First book is nigh impossible. I've had it once. Second book's a little easier. You think he's the best, the, the most, um, the best ca Canadian novelist and the least appreciated? No, no, I don't think he's the best a novelist. Uh, Why did you mention his name then? Well, you you asked me someone who's reasonably priced, but of course, uh, you know the ones that are reasonably priced are the common ones, and the ones that aren't common aren't so cheap. Mm. Dearly, over on hardcovers, uh, you will pay. I've, I've yet to see a hardcover road to the stilt house. Never seen one. It existed, but there might have only been 50. Mm. Never seen one. Mm. Um, well, I guess my what I'm sort of trying to get you to tell me is, uh, in your opinion, who is a really, really good, good author, Canadian author, uh, world class that may not be um, uh, ha have been acknowledged as such 
and and perhaps in the long run will will attain a, a, a reputation. And by collecting this person, you'd uh, you'd do all sorts of things. You'd you'd have a really good investment. Uh, is there is there such a beast? There, no, there there probably is, and I'm not. I don't have a ready answer for you because uh, these days I'm sort of looking at things that haven't been done, and I know that I'm not actually necessarily looking at the best. I'm just looking at the most unknown. Um, <clears throat> but there's lots of Canadian writers. Uh, that I think I don't know they're uncollected or almost uncollected there are very few that are collected and uh, you know I mentioned Rich Landon who's also collecting and writing the bibliography of Grant Allen who was born in Canada you may or may not know of him uh, but he knew everybody and he knew uh, uh, he collaborated with well-known writers sometimes 19, late 19th century. Like, he like died who? young. He died. He was 52 or something. But who did who did he hang around with then? Doyle, the whole the, the <coughs> pantheon. <coughs> yeah, he did. He was a journalist, and he knew. He Pound, knew it. you know, Pound. <coughs> nah, Joyce. Nah, he wasn't that. But the guys he knew, he was more apt to know Conrad than. Mm. Than pound, you know. And Conrad's a little earlier, anyway, though, right? Yeah. A little more old-fashioned taste. I mean, he wasn't—he was no modernist exactly. No. Although he was an iconoclast, he was an agnostic, and he wrote on it. Conrad well, or uh, Allen? Grant Allen. Yeah. Anyway, you, know, you got to be a real man to collect him. Only real men can collect a guy like Grant Allen because there's triple deckers to deal with, and, uh, and those have vanished utterly. Uh, there's a lot you of have to be a real man because there's, there's a Queen's Quorum title. There's stuff that costs money, and uh, if you're trying to buy from me, I'm going to charge you some money for some of them. I've sold every Grand Allen I've ever handled. Uh, but, you know, there are guys like that. Um, you have to be a real man because it's going to cost money, it's going to take space, and you're taking a risk? You're, you, you can forget about making money on it because it's going to cost you a lot you may recover your investment and you may not it's going to be tough and you're going to have to work and you're going to have to know something and you're not you can't sit on your fanny what do you mean it's going to be tough and you have to work what do you you're mean? going to have to ferret out a lot of them because he's not readily marketable so uh, you, you mean you, you you're not going to find him on eBay or Sotheby's because oh, he's oh. too minor. You're going to have to uh, go to the stores, go to shops. one by one. You're going to have to do some hunting. Yeah, you may find that fun, but it's but you you're going to go in places and they're going to say who? Oh yeah, didn't he write? Uh, I mean, they might pick one of his obscure books, and he could be in a lot of different sections. You have to do some work. So if you if you do find one, it's going to be worth quite a bit of money. No, not necessarily. No, no. Why are you interested in this guy? Because you think nobody knew? else is, and yet they ought to be. I and mean, then almost. Oh, okay, else. so you're giving me. Ah, uh, that's my one. personal. Well, yours and uh, and also rich. Uh, but I mean, it serves a purpose. You're doing stuff that sort of needs to be doing, and yet no one ever did. You know, here's we're a country, like it or not, and here's a notable Canadian like it or not, somebody ought to record some of the facts about them, you know. There are other guys that no one's done much on. Uh, you know, I, I like stuff like that because I don't like doing the same things that everybody mm -hmm. else is doing, mm -hmm. you know. And it gets back to, I think it gets back to I can, taste. It gets back to your and own it also ability. Gets back to crude money. Well, like, you know, if you can write a plausible story, you can charge real money for some of these things because they're damn rare. Good you know, stories. I once had uh, Bliss Carmen's first book, other than a couple little broadsides. It's the Black Tulip of Canadian poetry. I once had it, I had it twice. Bliss Carbon? Oh, my God. You know, you can get 20 bucks if you find some little old lady still alive, you know. There's a lot of Bliss Carbon, and most of it you can't give away. It's like trying to say sell James Russell Lowell or some other worthy but forgotten poet, you know. But uh, the first, his first book, 
was published was pirated in Toronto as a Christmas keepsake in 1888 or 1989. It's bloody rare. I mean, it's extremely rare. It even looks rare. It's sort of black, and uh, it's it looks rare. A little thin thing, you know. But it's, you could write a hell of a powerful story around that on rarity, on rarity, and and the fact that it got pirated, and why should it, that have happened, and. And how few, and then I go looking around to see how few copies there are. I mean, the bloody uh, book I mentioned that I wouldn't mention much on that I sold. This is the only copy. You're not going to tell us that. There were no copies Jeez. recorded in Canadian libraries. And on what do you mean? There are no copies recorded. You mean like they no, no Canadian libraries had it in their collection, and you can go check out all the libraries' records. More or less, uh, you can go online to Amicus. It's called, and uh, all the major libraries there. But of course, they haven't got around to cataloging every last book they've got. They don't have staff time, and you know, it's not every book they actually have. And they might have missed something. They do have, but when they all don't have it. It tells you something. It gets okay, maybe there are two, in fact, somewhere. And that's what gets your, because you, you, that's your rescuer mode, then. Well, this copy, what he paid for it, you can bet your bottom dollar it's not going to show up in a local jumble sale. Something is going to be done with that copy. It'll be controlled as much as we can control things from now on, unless the typhoon comes and blows his collection away. Cause he's oh, controlled, you mean protected. Yeah, when you've paid thirty five hundred yeah. for a book, you will it or you give it. More likely, it'll go be institutionalized. That yeah. seems to be what people do. But what it's not going to do is in, in a box of used books mm -hmm. taken to the used bookstore by his cousin after his death. Probably, you know, he's probably going to have it arranged. You know. So what? He's going to buy it, have a look at it, live with it for a little bit, and then donate it to a, an institution with well, his name on it and get a tax receipt. Depends on where he gives it, but likely, yeah. But, I mean, in the meantime, he's going to have the fun of doing it. It's not purely or necessary in any, de any desire. I mean, it could be very noble what he's yeah. meaning to do. It but may be what a lot of guys do, maybe what most guys do, but his instincts are noble enough. He's paying out of his own pocket. Yeah. He's not being subsidized. No. And he may or may not get a big tax receipt, which he may or may not need. Uh, but he would, his name would be attached to this interesting mm, find, perhaps. Yeah, so he's got little, ten people would know that that's... Yeah, but it's his little immortality deal, then. I suppose, but it's very modest, because he won't really... Uh, he's not setting out to, to build the collection in his area. Mm. It's one, it's a little collection. But he's got some good books so far, you know, like... Uh, uh, what What field is it in? Canadian. Just Canadian lit or Canadian something else? Lit. I mean, he likes a couple of popular authors, and I've encouraged him to. I like those guys too. Let's fill, you know, get all, gather all of those, because he did about 30, 40 books each. That's <laughs> good for me. <laughs> They're not expensive, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of them. Yep. You get to have a new present every so often. Oh, there's a new one to. I mean, I'm a collector, too. I know what you like to do. You like to get something new to rub a little bit that yeah. you didn't have before. And you collect... But uh, you don't want it all at once. You want no, it pulled out. Yeah, you know? that's right. You want something to look forward to. That's yeah. right. But you've got a great collection, as uh, you told me, and I haven't, haven't yet seen them, but uh, of, uh, Philip Larkin, right? Yeah, I have a nice little small collection. I haven't spent the kind of money you'd have to spend to, to be a major collection. What, what do you do? You have a major collection of, uh, or at least two, you know, a couple. You do, eh? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and you've got what all her, uh, all all the books, all her the magazine articles, you know, some of the original magazines. You've got uh, association those, uh, stuff. I've got most of the hardest ones. Yeah. You know, but no, I don't have all the magazines because yeah. I've been methodical about it. Yeah. I know a guy, a rival collector, that's been methodical about translations, and I certainly have, and I only have a few. He's been out of his own pocket ordering the Swedish edition of <laughs> Runaway, and yeah, <laughs> well, good more power to you. It <laughs> cost you about 75 bucks before the dust settles to get one of those novels over here from Serbia or something. You know, I, I <laughs> praise Margaret Atwood's papers, and. Often at the end of the appraisal, she will also include a lot of various foreign language editions of the current book that we're doing. That you know, 
the background papers are in there, the appraisal, right? And there's what, what do you mean appraisal? What are you talking about? Mark appraisal. Atwood. No, but you who you appraise someone's collection? Hers, her, her annual gifts to the library, her own stuff. I'm one know. of two guys who appraise Margaret Atwood's stuff that goes to to Fisher. You're, you're losing me here. You know Margaret Atwood is. I do know, and I know Every Fisher is the library. she gives some of her papers. Uh, she nets them out. Instead of giving them all to the National Library, she just sort of gives some. She gives them to the University of Toronto. Because that's where she and starts studying. Stuff she's been working on the past year or two, oh, mostly. Okay. Yeah. But they will also sometimes include a little uh, a clutch of much earlier material, you know. And... Uh, but it will also include books, various languages, Margaret Atwood's editions in Serbian and Persian and this and that, you know. And, it's and you do you appraise it so she can get a tax receipt? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, it's a cultural properties appraisal, and it comes to a lot of money sometimes. You know, it can come to six figures easily. It is Margaret Atwood. I mean, it could be a massive, well, she saves everything. It could be a massive amount of material and original artwork, too. Hers? Good. Yeah, she's pretty good, actually. She's what, like a little uh, uh, draw drawing or painting? She's always she's always done art since a child. I saw some stuff she did when she was eight years old. But she's some of her books, the covers are done by her, um, and she's uh, not bad. She's not untalented, and uh, sometimes you get original artworks of hers. Well, it should be readily saleable, I must say. Uh, I think you, you know, they don't come onto the market, really, but uh, some of them are quite appealing. Um, but, the, yeah, there's whole, you know, the whole archive on Alias Grace from sort of queries to researchers to various drafts and... Queries? Kind of stuff I mean queries. Well, I mean, the background research. I mean, she the, the, the she, she tells, came up with an idea. She wrote it down, the original she scribblings asked her of that. Assistant, find out if you know, who who was on Young Street that day in 1884. Mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of questions. Then they have to doggedly contact the library and do background research and things like that. So it's all the notes. And, yeah. Uh, literally from the genesis of the idea, if you're uh, to the various drafts till you get to the final corrective.